There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. Sing it loud. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinners perfectly. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength. Indeed is small Child of weakness Watch and pray Find me in Thy all in all Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe He left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Lord, now indeed I find Thy power in Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Cause Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He it white as snow And when Before the throne I stand In Him complete Jesus died My soul to save My lips Shall still repeat Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Cause Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Yeah, that was, that's the right song. One of my all-time favorites here. It's one thing when you get to lead and hand, you get to do just whatever you want to do. And I'm doing these old ones because that's all I know. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best In a world of lost sinners Was claimed So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange its 
someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true it's shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away to swim in his glory I'll share and I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday. Oh Lord my God When I in awesome wonder Consider all The world thy hands have made See the stars I hear the rolling thunder The power throughout the universe display I right, get loud Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee how great Thou art, how great Thou art, when Christ shall come, with shouts of acclamation, and when at home, what joy will fill my heart, and will come. And I in adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee How great Thou art How great Thou art How great Thou art How great Thou art Continuing our study through the book of Psalms, we come to Psalm 36, beginning with the first verse. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes. When he finds out his iniquity and when he hates... 
The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit, and he has ceased to be wise and to do good. He divides his wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. You give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, not let the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the works of iniquity have fallen. They have been cast down and are unable to rise. Here in Psalm 36, we find a contrast between humanity and God. The psalmist here provides a description of mankind's wickedness and God's holiness. We see a contrast between our corruption and God's perfection. Now, as we study this psalm, we take note that despite the wickedness of humanity that is expressed through the foolishness of selfish pride from the deceitfulness of the human heart, God is perfect in his character towards us. He's perfect in his interactions with us. And I'm not going to take time really to provide a formal exegesis of the first four verses because last week you'll remember as we looked at Psalm 32, we went in depth in defining sin. So I'm really not going to vest a lot of time in these first four verses. We did that last week. Really, I just want to draw your attention to simply this. In those first four verses, we see sin that is within the wickedness of the heart, sin that becomes expressed verbally, sin that is carried out in action and in schemes. We find that sin will move you from bad to worse. There's a progression in sin. The ungodly begins by simply stopping to do good and looking to the goodness of God. The sinner then spends more time meditating on evil. The wicked one then is resolutely set within himself to do evil. And finally, the conscience of the wicked is so hardened that he can do evil with an accommodating spirit within. That's the first four verses. That was last week what we talked about. You can pull it up on the YouTube channel or whatever you need to do to go back and get that. This week, I want us to focus on verse 5 thereafter. God's triple A. Because in these verses, we find three aspects or three things we need to grasp about God. We're going to see attributes, actions, and atonement. So that's our goal today, to look into those three aspects of who our God is. So let's just jump in with the first part, God's attributes. God's attributes. Once again, this picks up with verse 5 thereafter. We understand that God's creation has been corrupted, but God's character always has been and always will be perfect. And here the psalmist describes the character of God, the attributes of God. Not fully, not every single thing. It's not a laundry list, but from his perspective. David elucidates the character of God that he's experienced. In the text, we find specific descriptions of God's attributes. The first one is this, mercy. You see that in verse 5. Your mercy, O Lord is in the heavens. The first attribute of God we recognize this morning is his mercy. His mercy is in the heavens. As the heavens stretch far above us, as far as we can see, so God's mercy is endless. We have a God of mercy. We serve a God of mercy. The true and living God is a God of mercy. I read, I don't know who to give credit for this, but I read it. He that formed the ear, doth he not hear? He that formed the eye, doth he not see? 
He that formed the heart, doth he not feel? That's our God. He's a God of mercy. He's not a stoic, distant God on a throne looking down at you, seeing how life might play out. He's an actively engaged, involved God who demonstrates mercy. God is a being of infinite tenderness and compassion that plays out in our lives because he's characterized by mercy. It is one of his attributes. His mercy is expressed by the rain that falls and the sun that shines on every person. That's God's mercy. His mercy is revealed in the reality of his long suffering towards humanity. The fact that he patiently waits, drawing us to repentance, that's God's mercy. Because in reality, without God's mercy, none of us would be here right now. If God was not a God of mercy, we would not exist. Born into sin, we would receive the consequence of sin and that would be it. But we have a God of mercy. So we see here God described in the backdrop or with the backdrop of a wicked creation, a fallen creation, a sinful humanity that sins against him, that rebels against him. And yet, what's the first characteristic he displays towards us? The first attribute he maintains perfectly, his mercy. We have a merciful God this morning. The psalmist continues enlisting the attributes of God. Still in verse five, he says we have a God of faithfulness. A God of faithfulness. In fact, notice the description. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. That's a long way, isn't it? As the clouds encompass the earth, so God's faithfulness surrounds his creation. God is faithful to his creation. He's faithful to us. Psalm 5710 tells us that God's truth reaches the clouds. When you talk about God's faithfulness, you combine it with truth because faithfulness is truth to what you've already said, what you've promised, and who you are. In fact, the word faithfulness here, as used, it refers to God's fidelity to every promise he has ever made. It is his unswavering attachment to those whom he loves. It is his undeviating commitment to maintain his truth. He's completely faithful in every capacity. God is faithful to any promise he has ever made. God is completely faithful to those to whom he loves and calls his own. He's completely faithful to the truth that he set forth in his word. He's completely true. In fact, Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he not said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? God is completely perfect in his faithfulness. If he said it, he'll do it. If he promised it, it'll happen. If he set it forth, it will be. God is faithful. God is faithful completely, completely true and faithful. He, he is fully committed to the expressions of his love and truth towards us because of his own character. He will not contradict his own truth, his own love, his own character. It's against his character to contradict his character, if that makes sense. It's against his character to contradict his truth. It's against his character to go against his promise. So he's completely, perfectly faithful. So it's in our God that we experience his faithfulness that is perfectly consistent regardless of who we are or what we do. You see, I might be faithful towards you till you hurt my feelings, and then my faithfulness towards you wanes. I might be faithful to you till you do something against one of my kids and then maybe my faithfulness really isn't true any longer. But see, God's faithfulness is perfectly consistent towards us regardless of who we are, 
Regardless of our actions, attitudes, or words, regardless of what we do, God's faithfulness towards us remains perfectly consistent. I cannot make God stop being faithful towards me. Now, that faithfulness may be expressed in different ways. For example, if I'm one of his children and I'm off in the far country and I'm rebelling against his will for my life, God's faithfulness not, might not just be in flowery blessings. It might be in the faithfulness to discipline me and chastise me to draw me back, but it's still his faithfulness. You see, we have a God who's completely faithful. Out of his mercy, he's faithful to us. But the psalmist continues. He expresses the next attribute of God, beginning with verse 6, and that's righteousness. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Righteousness that's like great mountains. There's kind of a dualistic reference here. You know, great mountains loom over the land. They're observable by all people. And so is God's righteousness. It's undeniable. You cannot deny the righteousness of God. In fact, what draws us ultimately to a place of salvation is when we come to understand the supreme righteousness of God and our ineptness to be righteous. It looms over us like a towering mountain. And we know we can't reach the pinnacle in and of ourselves because he's that righteous. You know, we have made several trips to Colorado to visit my brother and whatnot, and some of you have been out that way. As you approach the Rocky Mountains, you can't deny they're there. You can't ignore them. They loom over the landscape. Well, that's God's righteousness. God is righteous in this world, and you cannot deny his righteousness. It looms over all of creation, and just like those mountains are unmovable, God's righteousness is unmovable, unchanging, perfectly consistent. God is righteous so much so he is the standard of righteousness. He has an unmovable, perfect righteousness. God's righteousness speaks to the perfection of his character. It's expressed in the perfection of everything he does, and it sets the standard of righteousness so that the words of the prophet are true when he says that all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags before our God because our God's supreme righteousness sets such a high standard that we can't achieve it. Our God is righteous supremely. In fact, that brings us to the next kind of reference there, that reference to being like mountains, these high mountains that are so fixed and can't be moved, that carries the meaning of intensity. Intensity. It's a statement of how intense the righteousness of God is. God exists in this intense, extreme state of righteousness. Complete holiness is what that is. In his complete holiness, he has set a standard of righteousness that we hopelessly cannot attain, which draws our hearts ever more to what God has done for us. Your mind is probably already gone there to 2 Corinthians 5.21, where the Apostle Paul said that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. See, we have a God of intense, extreme righteousness that we can't obtain, but because of his mercy, because he's faithful to us, he has interceded to impart righteousness to us through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. No, I can't become righteous, and I can't achieve righteousness. I can't climb God's high standard of righteousness, but I don't have to. Jesus imputes his righteousness to me. That's the work of Jesus. That's what he's done. Because we have this righteous God who exists in such a high and exalted righteous state. The psalmist continues though. Another attribute of God he speaks of here is God's authority. Still in verse six, he says, your judgments are a great deep. Your judgments are a great deep. That 
phrase great deep. It means great, uh, deep waters. It, it means great waters. It means a great flood. It's something that is unstoppable and overpowering. It's a reference to the reality that God's judgments are unstoppable, powerful, completely right, and no one escapes them. God holds supreme judgment. He holds authority, all authority. And no one supersedes his authority, gets around his authority. God holds ultimate authority over creation and eternity. The reality is Psalm 97. There we find that righteousness and justice are described as the foundations of God's throne. In his righteousness and in his authority, he sits on a throne over all creation. He has supreme authority because he has supreme righteousness. And so God has supreme authority. What we see referenced here is this divine administration over creation, a divine economy over life. All of history falls under this divine administration, a governing force over all of history, of over all of life. That is God. God has ultimate authority. The administration of human affairs, the administration over creation, the administration of history is God's administration. He wasn't elected to it. He just owns it because he's the creator, and he wields authority. Now, it is true that he has seen fit to grant leeway under his authority. For example, we know that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We know that Satan had authority to tempt Jesus and offer him kingdoms and so on and so forth. So under God's authority, he's granted leeway. We know that he's granted human beings free will. We can choose. Will we receive him? Will we reject him? Will we serve him? Will we not? Will we abide in his will? Will we refuse his will? Yet he's still in authority. Great deep, unstoppable power, ultimate authority, an authoritative God. But that term great deep also means an unsearchable depth beyond comprehension. So when we talk about God and his judgments, we also see that they're compared to this profound abyss, the depth of which cannot be measured. The judgments of God are beyond our comprehension. We understand, yes, he holds authority, but we don't understand his thoughts. God's judgments, his thoughts, his ways, his dealings with humanity, they are so often beyond our ability to measure with our human reasoning. Our cognitive ability falls short of seeing into the mind of God. We are so finite in what we can grasp. The attributes of God so often are just too deep for us to sound out, to measure, to understand. So we have to understand that much of God's authority, many of his actions, much of the truth about him specifically is simply an unfathomable mystery. We are simply too finite in our minds to comprehend the infinite aspects of God. What we know of God is what he's revealed in his word that we should know about him, but there's so much more that's beyond our capability to grasp. We're finite in our understanding. We're limited to look into the great deep. Yet we have a God of authority we trust. Why do we trust him? Because he's completely righteous, demonstrating faithfulness out of his mercy. So I abide under his authority. The psalmist lists another attribute of God here. Continuing in verse 6. He says, O oh Lord, you preserve man and beast. Here we see the compassion of God. Compassion is an attribute of our God. He takes compassion over his creation to preserve man and beast. That is a loving concern for his creation. 
God has a loving concern for his creation. There's probably no song more theologically sound than the song the preschoolers sing when they sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Our God has a genuine loving concern over his creation. In fact, Jesus mentions this. He talked about in Matthew 6 how God clothes the lilies of the field, how he feeds the birds of the air. He takes care of his creation. In fact, Jesus went on in Matthew 10, really talking about the infinite wisdom of God, but still applicable, that not even a sparrow will fall without God's knowledge. Why? Because he has a concern over his creation. He's a compassionate God, a loving God. He's a God of compassion. See, he has authority because of his righteousness. He demonstrates faithfulness because of his mercy, but it all unfolds in a compassion towards us. He's compassionate towards us. He is compassionate to still maintain oversight in a world that has been corrupted by sin and rebelled against him. In fact, in Isaiah 49, God says that a mother will forget her nursing child and will stop having com uh, compassion on the child of her womb before his compassion is exhausted towards us. Great and deep is God's compassion. He loves us. He's a loving God. The psalmist here, David, he lays out these aspects of God's attributes, the character of God. He notes that they're deep and he probably can't fully grasp all of it. But I think here's what David realized. In, in trying to fully comprehend the divine attributes of God, we may struggle. I mean, how can the infinite comprehend the infinite? Or the finite comprehend the infinite? But even in the mysteries, as we try to consider the things that we can't grasp, it moves us to a, to a place where we learn humility, where we're inspired towards reverence. These attributes of God should orient our hearts towards faith and a hope based in his character. How? How can I be certain about this gospel we talk about? Because I had this loving God who has the authority to offer the gospel because of his righteousness, who's completely faithful because of his mercy. So even if I can't grasp it all, it pushes me towards trust in the gospel anyway. Because who else can do it but God? So we find these attributes of God, but the text moves on beyond attributes to action. We see God's actions. You see, because God has these attributes, these attributes then are played out in action. Because after all, action speaks louder than word, right? And so here we are, humanity fallen, sinned against God, yet his actions towards us remain perfect because they're driven by his perfect character. And so David begins to describe the actions of God. Taking things out of the sphere of the theoretical, theoretical, here's who God is, to here's what God does for me. The actions of God. We've moved into verse 7 by this point. The first action of God listed is God's loving kindness towards us. How precious is your loving kindness, O oh God? We find that God expresses a loving kindness towards us that is precious. Now, it's very interesting, at least to me, the word loving kindness used here in verse 7 is translated from the exact same Hebrew word used in verse 5 for mercy. Exact same word. Yet in one context, it's mercy. In one context, it's loving kindness. When you look into that, here's what you find. There's a variance of expression. 
God is mercy. His mercy is expressed in the form of loving kindness. It's the same attribute of God, but one describes God and one is the action of God. Loving kindness is God's mercy in action. That's what's described here. Loving kindness is the expression of God's mercy, mercy in action. Think of it this way. You step outside and you see the sun. You recognize the light of the sun. That would be mercy. But then you feel the warmth of the sun and you see the growth that the sun produces. That's loving kindness. It's the sun in action. Well, loving kindness is God's mercy in action. And the reality is, God's endless mercy is expressed, it is is lavished upon us in countless acts of loving kindness. God displays mercy in tangible ways, probably so many times and in so many ways that we don't even recognize it. God intercedes and interacts in our lives through action, loving kindness. Sometimes, it, with hindsight, we look back and recognize what he did. Sometimes we never even realize it. Sometimes it's very, very bluntly put in front of us and we see, oh, that's God's love. That's his loving kindness. That's his mercy in action. But you see, God displays a loving kindness in our lives. He loves us actively. So much so, the text here says it's precious. That means excellent. God's loving kindness is precious. It's excellent as expressions of God's love exceed all that we deserve and even what we can comprehend. I mean, do I really deserve expressions of his mercy? No, I don't. But that's who he is. And he pours his mercy out in tangible ways to me beyond what I can even comprehend. It's precious. You see, we can say God's a loving God, and that's true. But God blesses your life with his loving kindness every day. It's not a theoretical love. It's a practical love in action that you would experience in and out of daily day life. And you may recognize it, you may not, but it's there. We, he, he's a God of loving kindness. The psalmist moves on. Still verse 7. He speaks of God's loving kindness, and because of God's loving kindness, what does he say? Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wing. We see another action of God. God provides trusted shelter. God provides trusted shelter. In fact, God offers himself as the place of shelter. It's not that God builds you a shelter. God says, I am your shelter. I am your shield and your buckler. I am that resolute place that you can find security. We have a God who says, you can trust the shelter I provide under the shadow of my wings. a sheltering place under the shadow of God's wings. Deuteronomy chapter 32 describes this sheltering of God, comparing him to an eagle. It says this, As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, that is God's sheltering protection. We have a God who will hover over us, encircle us, watch over us, shadow us, protect us, and lift us up as we need it. He does that. It's an active trait. It's an action. It's not just an attribute. God loves us enough to care. It's an attribute put into action. He's our sheltering place. In our weakness, in our fear, we can trust God to be our protector, to be our defender. We can take refuge under the shadow of his wing, and we're blessed when we do that. 
Boaz was speaking to Ruth about how she was looking to find protection under the shadow of God's wings. Came out of a pagan society into the Jewish culture, looking to the true and living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And she put her trust under the sheltering wings of God. And Boaz recognized that. And he said, you've been blessed because under whose wings you have come for refuge, you've received blessing. You're blessed when you go to God to shelter under his wings. Psalm 57.1 promises that we can trust God in the shadow of his wings to be our refuge in the face of calamity. See, God is actively involved to be our sheltering refuge. Reverend C. Clements in his commentary said this, How intense the repose when we make God our refuge. From the plots of men, from the strife of tongues, from the perils of every kind, we hide in God. Blessed and safe in his almighty keeping. The psalm goes on. What's another action of God? Verse 8 tells us that God meets our need so that we are satisfied. You see that? They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. Satisfaction from the fullness of your house. Now, if you're reading a very traditional translation, it'll say from the fatness of your house. But some of you honestly don't need to talk about fatness. So let's say fullness. I like that. I have a full figure, not a fat figure. My my coat will button sometimes because it's a full-figured coat, right? It's not fat people coat. The fullness of God's house. You're satisfied from the fullness of God's house. From the rich provisions of God himself come your satisfaction. That's what the text says. My satisfaction comes as my needs are met from God's own rich provisions. Now, Primarily, I believe this is speaking of spiritual satisfaction. My spiritual needs, the spiritual needs of my soul are satisfied in the presence of God's house. That is in his presence. Peace of heart and mind are found in the courts of God's presence. Spiritual satisfaction. Joy that's inexpressible is a provision that comes from the courts of God's presence. I abide with a peace from God that is a provision of God as I abide in his presence. I have this joy, the Bible says, is inexpressible. It's full of glory. It it is God's provision to me as I abide in his presence. See, there's a satisfaction from God, a spiritual satisfaction. It is a satisfaction that people across the world hunger to feel and try to feel in a myriad of ways through all kinds of worldly means and never can be satisfied because satisfaction comes only from God. A satisfaction from the fullness of his house. A spiritual satisfaction. But I also believe it can reference physical needs as well. I believe God does tend to our physical needs in life. I mean, God's word assures us he knows what we have need of before we even ask. We know that he moves to meet the necessities of our lives, according to Matthew 6, 33. The psalmist said, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. So I do believe it can refer to physical need as well that God tends to our needs that we're satisfied, but that satisfaction is in him and what he brings into our lives. And so God moves to meet our needs so that we're satisfied. But not only that, there's a fourth action listed here. Still in verse eight, he says, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. You know what else God does actively in our lives? God gives us blessings that bring pleasure. He gives us blessings that bring pleasure. Now, a few people, especially the 
you know, the holiest of the holy of us are kind of cringing. Oh, wait a minute, pleasures? Now, didn't that mean sin? No. We've gotten this weird deal sometime in our church that, uh, well, if I enjoy pleasures, I must be doing something wrong. Because if it's enjoyful, it can't be good. Well, the reason we think that is because sin is pleasurable. Fulfilling the sinful desires of the flesh, that's pleasurable. If sin wasn't pleasurable, no one would do it. But did you know that you can live life honoring God and still enjoy the pleasures of life? In fact, I think God wants you to. I think he blesses us in ways that we enjoy pleasures. It just might be that when you come to faith in Christ and begin to living for him and being committed to his lordship, that what brings you pleasure is vastly different than what used to bring you pleasure. I mean, yesterday, a big group, we're all out on the river, we're just messing around. We enjoyed pleasure together. And as far as I know, no one sinned. If they did, they did it when I wasn't floating by them. You see, God wants us to enjoy life, blesses us to enjoy life, and we should be able to enjoy pleasures in life. In fact, man, if anyone were to come into a church group and go to one of our Bible studies or come to one of our fellowships, they are to look at us and say, man, those people know how to have a good time. Because after all, we don't bear the burden of sin anymore. We're not under the guilt of sin. We're not under condemnation. We live in a living hope. We've been justified by Christ. We have an eternal life that we're living in right now. We're just looking for him to return. We have all the answers. We have it all figured out. Why? Because we have the book. What I don't know, I don't have to worry about. God has it figured out. It's a great life. Why shouldn't people look at me and say, man, I'd like to have what that guy's on a little bit. Life with pleasures. Give them drink from the rivers of your pleasures. It's really neat because the literal translation says, from the rivers of your Edens. Now think about Eden, the Garden of Eden. We have pictured here access to an inexhaustible river of delight, such as the stream that watered Eden, that delightful place God created for man to reside in that perfect place of residence. God, give them pleasures from your Eden. Now, not that God blesses us with a perfect life, free from sin's curse or free from trouble or hardship, but from his eternal goodness, he blesses us with what we need, above what we deserve, so that we experience pleasure in life. The truth expressed here is really this. In communion with God, we find not only our needs met, but a divine peace and joy that brings pleasure in life. When I bask in God's presence, I enjoy pleasures because I'm in his presence. The joy he imparts, the peace I experience, enables me to have a, a joyful or a pleasant experience in life simply because of who he is and what he does in my life. Psalm 51 describes the work, excuse me, Isaiah 51 describes the work of God. I really like this description. I won't read it to you. Let me just give you the synopsis. In, in Isaiah 51, here's what you find. God takes the wastelands of your life and makes them into an oasis of Eden. He takes the desert places that we pass through and turns them into the lush and fruitful land of Eden. God blesses our lives with gladness and joy so that our hearts become filled with thanksgiving. That's what we're talking about here. We drink from the rivers of his pleasure. He fills our lives so that our hearts are so full of gladness and joy, we overflow with thanksgiving towards God. It doesn't mean life's easy. It doesn't mean we don't have bad or difficult situations. But it means overall, basking in his presence, we experience this joyfulness a pleasure from God. So we see God's attributes and we see God's actions that come because of his attributes. But there's one overriding, probably the most important, honestly, statement this psalm makes about God. It's good to know what we can about God's attributes. 
And it's good to understand what we can about God's actions. But the most pressing thing in Psalm 36 is about God's atonement. Now, God's atonement is founded upon his perfect attributes expressed in his loving actions. It is from his attributes, through his actions, we find his atonement for sin. But we have to grasp this. The most pressing thing God does to demonstrate his mercy, his faithfulness, his righteousness, his authority, and his compassion, the most pressing thing that he does to pour out his loving kindness in our life, to meet our needs, to bring us pleasure, and so forth, the most pressing thing he does is to provide atonement for sin. In fact, look at verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. God provides the fountain of life. Now, in a general sense, overall, general sense, the ultimate source of all life is God. All living things, all living beings originate in God. Be it plants or animals or angels or people, God is the originator. He's the fountain that starts all life. We recognize that in a general sense, but in a very specific sense, he is the fountain of spiritual life. The source of spiritual life is God. No one creates spiritual life. No one attains spiritual life. No one acquires a spiritual life in and of themselves. God is the source of spiritual life. Ephesians chapter 2, the first five verses. And you, God made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The first five verses of Ephesians 2 very bluntly and plainly stated, I don't know how you could miss it. God made you alive. You were dead because of sin, but God made you alive with Christ. God is the source of spiritual life. Spiritual life originates with God. It's produced by God. It's provided by God. He's done the work in it. He offers it. He completes it. He fulfills it. He seals it. It's all God's work. It's because of God's rich mercy, because of his great love. It is by his grace that those of us who were dead in sin have now been made alive in Christ. It's the work of God. He's the fountain of spiritual life. See, spiritual life is the work of God. It is provided by God. It is through the sacrificial death and resurrection of God in the form of Jesus Christ that we can be made spiritually alive. The fountain of all life, physical or spiritual, is God. It's God. Jesus said this, John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say unto you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. This person shall not come to judgment. Why? Because he has passed from death unto life. That spiritual life. See, Jesus, he never hid it from anyone. He very bluntly, very plainly would say, because of your sin, you're dead, spiritually dead. You suffer the condemnation of sin, separation from God throughout eternity but you can pass from death unto life if your trust is in me. Not that you believe that I am, but that you truly trusted me to be who I said I am and I do what I do. 
We pass from death unto life because of the work of Jesus. Eternal life is the gift of God through Jesus Christ. And it is not found in any other source. You will not obtain spiritual life by your good works or your good morals, by your church memberships or your baptism. You'll not find spiritual life because you think God will weigh you in the balance one day and things will work in your favor. Spiritual life comes only through faith in Jesus. Jesus said this, whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give will become a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. There's your fountain of life right there. It's in Jesus. It's what he gives. So we see that spiritual life is provided by God through the redemptive work of Christ. But not only has God provided this fountain of life, look at what else verse 9 says. God is the light that reveals eternal life and leads us to the fountain of life. In your light we see light. What that means is you've provided it and then you've illuminated the way to receive it. Not only have you provided eternal life, you have provided the light we need to see eternal life. God becomes the light that leads us to life. In the first chapter of John describing Jesus, it says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or overcome it. In God is life, and in him is the light to lead us to life. He reveals our need for life. He's the one that makes that happen. The darkness of the sinful world can't overcome the light of life that is in Christ. John 8 says he's the light of the world. You're not going to overcome that light. He illuminates it. We see our need for him. The problem is we don't respond to the light sometimes. It's in God's light that we see light. That is, his spirit illuminates our understanding to spiritual death and our need for spiritual life. There's not one person here, not one of you here, who's born again. Not one of you received eternal life without the Spirit of God illuminating your understanding to your sinfulness, your lostfulness, and your need to come to faith in Christ. God was the light that drew you there. So God is the fountain of life and the light to draw you to the fountain. God does that. He does that. Without the illumination of God, we would still be in the darkness of sin and death. In fact, some people really are. You remember what Jesus told Nicodemus? When he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he who believes is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And listen to what he said. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light lest his deeds be exposed. Here's what Jesus said. I've come to give you eternal life because of God's love for you. He's the light to draw you into that eternal life. But here's the problem. Some of you remain condemned because you won't put your trust in me. You prefer to reside in the darkness of sin than to step in the light of God and receive his life. You see, the Bible tells us God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's shown the light for people to see the need for repentance, but he won't make anyone. He won't make anyone bow in submission to Jesus. He won't make anyone willingly put their trust in Jesus. He won't make you. He simply illuminates your understanding and says, do you want it? And it's up to you to respond and say, Jesus, I admit it. I'm a sinner and I can't be righteous enough. I can't be good enough. But I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe you rose again and you can forgive me and give me eternal life. So I confess right now, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord, my Savior. I give you my life. You either do that, you stay in the darkness. If you stay in the darkness, you stay in condemnation. 
And the condemnation of sin is an eternity separated from God in a place of torment and suffering. So God is the fountain of life. He is the light to draw you into the fountain of life. What happens when you step into the fountain of life and receive by faith everlasting life? Well, what happens is God becomes the father of loving kindness to all who know him. Verse 10 says, oh, continue your loving kindness. To who? To those who know you. Those who are in relationship with you, God, continue this loving kindness. Can I tell you that when you become a child of God, you become a child of the loving Father, the perfect Heavenly Father who has a perfect loving kindness? The book of John says that those who receive Jesus, who believe in him with their heart, who trust in him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. You become a child of the true and living God. You're adopted into a perfect family with a perfect father. Now, your brothers and sisters here, well, we're messed up. We're the kind of people you won't want to introduce to your other family at the family reunion. I get that. That's no big deal. But the heavenly family, man, what a family to belong to. And God says, I'll be your loving heavenly father. Verse 10 speaks about how he continues to impart righteousness. He imparts righteousness to us when we come to faith. He indwells with the Holy Spirit to empower us to live in righteousness. But look at verse 12. This is a statement almost as a, as, as a uh, prophetic statement. It's almost like the psalmist is looking off somewhere. There! There! The workers of iniquity, they have fallen. They have fallen. They've been cast down. They're not able to rise up. It's almost as if David looked across the way and saw those separated from God. And he said, there's the wicked. There's the wicked. They're fallen. They're cast down. You know what that is? That's a description of those who will refuse Christ. That's a description of those who will not step into the fountain of life that God illuminates and by faith receive eternal life. That's a description of those who will remain in the darkness. It's a description of those who are dead in sin. They're fallen. They're cast down. They're unable to rise. If you're here right now in this building or you're listening online, here's the reality for you. If you have never come to faith in Jesus Christ, yielding your life to him as your Lord and Savior, you're fallen. You're cast down. You will never be able to rise up. In this earthly life, you will live in a dejected state with God, alienated from his hand of blessing. And in eternity, you will be a, apart from him. You'll be cast down in torment. You'll never rise in deliverance. It's eternal. That's the consequence of sin. That's what Jesus paid for on your behalf so that you could escape it. My friends, God's actions and his attributes make him infinitely worthy of our trust. His mercy and his loving kindness have provided a fountain of life. We can drink from it through faith. But apart from that life, we are fallen, we're cast down, we will never rise out of torment. Where are you at today? Have you drank from the fountain of life? Have you bowed before the Lord Jesus, receiving him as your Savior, and he has given you a water that has become a well springing up into you unto eternal life? Are you fallen, cast down, never to rise again? Where are you at right now? Because you see, these attributes of God and these actions of God, they bring comfort to the born-again believer. But if you're not one of God's children, they should strike fear and terror in you. Because God is perfect in his righteousness and his justice, and he will hold you accountable for sin. He'll do exactly what he said he'll do in his word. And he'll look at you and say, depart from me. I never knew you. And cast you out into everlasting fire. Where are you at with God today?